There's a big issue in tourism, and no one's talking about it. We're probably not talking about it because we're distracted by stuff like this. There's no shortage of places these days that look absolutely amazing. Inviting clear water, delicious cocktails, and infinity pools. Oh, we love us some infinity pools. White sand for strolling, tanning, playing, and some really good food to eat before we collapse again. For many, this stuff is pure tourism cash. But what if I told you all that cash wasn't going to the destination? Traditionally, these all-inclusive island resort trips have been called yo-yo tourism. The money goes in, and then it gets yanked right back off the island. All those hotel and dining profits are immediately sent to corporate headquarters in other countries. And the only money that stays in the destination is employing lower level housekeeping, maintenance and staff workers, plus some extra food supplies and some taxes. Oh, and of course the construction of the property and utilities. All that is not nothing, but it's also not the lion's share of the tourism money. In this video, I want to let you in on one of the tourism industry's best kept secrets this same tourism yo-yo economy, to a somewhat lesser extent, is happening everywhere. Which means all that visitor spending money that destinations are always talking about is not quite what it seems. Now, whether you're running a destination or sending people to one, where visitors stay and eat and shop matters. Here's the good news. There are some smart policies that will help keep more money in the local economy and some tips to help you do it as well. And that's what I'm going to get into today. A few years ago, because that's the last year I could find a total number for this, global government spending on tourism, marketing and promotion topped $413 billion, according to the World Travel and Tourism Council. Let me say that number again. $413 billion. A few national tourist offices have marketing budgets in the billions of euros, like France has 7.5 billion euros and Spain has 12.3 billion. But even smaller destinations and cities spend millions or tens of millions to attract visitors. Any way you slice it, it's an awful lot of money, and it begs a big question. I'm going to let Dutch professor Ko Kearns ask it. What is the point of spending all this money to bring in visitors if a significant amount, it could be even half of it or more, doesn't end up in the destination? But on top of that, having all these visitors can diminish the quality of life for local people, the quality of the environment, the quality of the culture, everything that's being visited is affected by this. Yeah what he said. We have been measuring visitors and hotel nights, average daily rates of hotel rooms, even total visitor spending. But if the money is not injected into the local economy, what's the point? To put it another way, if you give your kid $5 for lunch money, but a bully at school takes $2. Give us your lunch money. Why would you use $5 when calculating what the school receives? The school's only getting three bucks. Some kid with an early growth spurt and a bad attitude is getting the rest. Let's say an Airbnb property costs $100 a night. Airbnb gets about 20% or 20 bucks, and that goes straight to the headquarters in California, and about 80% stays in the local economy, unless the property is owned by someone who doesn't live in that destination, or even in that country, in which case 20% still goes to Airbnb, and 80% goes to wherever the owner happens to be living, and basically zero money from their accommodation goes into the local economy. An accommodation makes up about 30% of visitor spending. Hotels are a little more complicated, but not much. Let's start with the big chains, the Hiltons and the Marriotts in a core brand. About 20 to 25% goes directly to Amsterdam if customers come through booking.com or to Palo Alto if they go through Google or wherever the hell hotels.com does their banking. And then about 9 to 17% of that money goes to the corporate headquarters of the hotel chain to cover the licensing of the name and the management services and IT and other stuff. And these hotel chains often have mandatory supply deals so the hotels have to order much of their food and their hotel outfits and room amenities from certain places which are not likely in your destination. And many of the hotels you think are independent are actually owned and operated by larger hotel groups like Ambridge Hospitality, which manages around 1,500 hotels in 20 countries and has headquarters in Texas with revenues of over $5 billion. 
Also, Hilton and Marriott and other big chains rarely own the hotels themselves. The actual owners are real estate investment groups that you've probably never heard of. Companies like Apple Hospitality, Xenia Hotels and Resorts, Park Hotels and Resorts, Sunstone Hotel Investors. That's where the lion's share of the profit goes. You're starting to get the idea. The money isn't just leaking out of your destination like water through a rusty pipe. It's gushing out. To check my math, I decided to ask this guy. Roger is one of the world's top hotel consultants. He knows this stuff better than anyone. And destinations use him to assist with smart hotel taxation and ownership policies. That is a local investor. Uh, if it's an international investor, there are also many variables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are always variables and lots of confusing bits I didn't quite follow. But the actual, the big money from an owner's point of view is going to be reflected in the PL. But eventually, we got to the bottom line. In the best case scenario, most of that spend will remain in the local economy. In the worst case scenario, we could see very clearly that 50% may leave the local economy, if not more. The leakage is considerably less when it comes to food, but it's more common for locals to run restaurants. But there is still a multinational presence, and that means leakage. So Starbucks, the world's highest grossing franchise, requires a $315,000 license fee to open a store. Plus they get 7% of total revenue, then the owner needs to order their coffee and equipment and supplies, all that stuff from Starbucks. Assuming the Starbucks franchise has a local owner, the majority of the money will stay in the country, but this varies by region. So globally, Starbucks owns 50% of their coffee stores. But in China, for example, Starbucks owns all 6,000 of their stores, but it does try to source their China coffee locally. Now, to be fair, most other fast food franchises are more likely to have local owners, but the money is still leaking out. And let's not forget about retail. The standard retail markup on say a Rolex is officially about 40% obviously more for some more popular models. So on a $10,000 watch, 6,000 goes to Rolex, 4,000 stays in the local economy. A little over half of the profit on luxury fashion items goes to the local retailer, about 55 to 62%. The rest goes to the corporate headquarters. Now it varies by destination. Some destinations have more locally owned hotels than restaurants and sell more locally owned products, and some skew the other way. And let's keep in mind that 40% of a $10,000 watch has a bigger local economic impact than 100% of a $500 painting. Then there are things like cleaning up the city streets and beaches and emptying the trash cans around the city, perhaps some extra police or lifeguards for tourism areas, typically handled by the city. So those costs are not factored in to the bottom line of tourism. But the amount that stays in the local economy seems like a pretty important metric to get your head around if you're spending a lot to bring in visitors. And everyone is. Obviously, if destinations factor in these leakages, it will lower their big revenue number. But this is the economic reality. Like the old adage, forewarned is forearmed. If they embrace it, they can make smart policy changes to improve the local economic impact. Now, Destinations are often justifying their marketing by telling politicians that for every dollar they spend on marketing, they earn back $5 or $10 on tourism spending. I mean, that's huge ROI, but it doesn't account for the amount that stays in the local economy. It will still be impressive ROI, even with the leakage factored in. So shouldn't we all be talking about that number instead? Then I spoke to this guy. Adam Sachs, the president of Tourism Economics. He advises a lot of destinations on the economic benefits of tourism. So absolutely it's a thing, what you're describing. So then the question is, how big of a thing is it, right? And, and how much should it be factored in to these ROI numbers that are presented, that for every dollar we invest in marketing or for every group we bring in, right? It's, it's generating this much in, in uh, economic activity. My short answer is that there's actually stuff they're not counting as well as stuff they are. And what I mean by that is that um, while there's some leakage, there's also the ripple effect of those, the dollars that do stay through local suppliers and then the people that earn that money that then spend that money locally. So there's a bit of an upside to the analysis as well as that, that leakage that, that needs to be counted. But, 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 there's always a but, to be fair, it did make some pretty good points. Points like this. 
because you're creating the amenities, the attractions, the experiences, the quality of life. They're like, oh, and also the exposure, right? You're bringing people mm -hmm. in and they're like, you know what? I could get used to this, right? And uh, and so it can be the sort of the, uh, the, the, you know, the open door to economic development. We're seeing a lot of destination marketing organizations uh, work in concert with economic development. So Adam and I were chatting for like 20 minutes and at one point I thought I had to redo this entire video to take into consideration all of the fine detailed points he made. But then upon reflection, I realized this really comes down to all the leakages and we already defined that and it's happening. So I think we're gonna go with that. How do destinations fix this? For starters, it probably makes sense to adjust tax policy. If there's a locally owned and operated hotel or Airbnb, those can have an enormously bigger impact on the local economy than if it's foreign owned. Such ownership can be encouraged and discouraged through taxes. So for example, a hotel could be forced to pay one rate when it's locally owned and operated and another rate when it's a non-local franchise that's locally owned and yet a third rate when it's a non-local franchise that's not locally owned. That may not happen soon, so until then, if you're sending visitors to places or booking your own trip, and you want to see as much of the money as possible stay and help the local destination, you're going to need to do a little homework and see which properties are actually locally owned and managed. And then generally steer clear of those brands you recognize while you're in the destination, unless you're going on a luxury shopping binge, in which case... Cha ching That's all for today. I hope you'll join me for future installments of this series. Just a five minute or so quick dose to give you a fundamental understanding of some of these key topical issues that the industry is wrestling with. These insights may help you personally capitalize on new trends or keep you informed so you can lend your voice to urge politicians and associations toward making positive changes that this industry needs to stay ahead. Until next time.